Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Vita Learning webinar. Today we've got uh, Mr. Mark Wagenseal. Wave to everyone, Mark. <laughs> Make sure your camera's working. So we're we're good. So welcome, everyone. Uh, today we're actually going to talk about um, Class Three bilateral cross bite dentures, which is something uh, you know that really we kind of know but don't know so we've got mark wagon seal who's a uh, denturist to actually explain to everyone uh how this should be treated uh, how we approach it uh, you know how we methodically go through the uh, model analysis and so forth like that to place the teeth within the boundaries that are comfortable for the patient and are correct for that individual uh, patient as well so just a couple uh, housekeeping uh, items. Everyone's phone currently is on mute. So on the panel of the GoToWebinar, there is a question box. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it in. If it's something that uh, is uh, apropos for that minute or so forth, I, I will interrupt uh, Mark like I often do and ask him a question or ask them your question, I should say. Otherwise, at the end of the program, we are going to have a uh, lengthy uh, Q&A session with Mark, so which is kind of open to any types of questions. Uh, but again, uh, you're on mute. Use that uh, question box, type in your questions, send them through, and then we will uh, proceed from there. We also will do uh, CE and also record this webinar. So the recording itself, is going to be posted on our website, Vita North America website, or our social media platforms, including YouTube. Uh, give us about a day or two, and we will get that uh, squared away and on our website. Uh, so to get this going, we got a lot of uh, information to uh, uh, talk about, discuss, uh, Mark. So let me introduce you. Uh, Mark Wagenseal, he is a denturist. He's a VITA Global Certified Trainer and Management Consultant. He's a licensed denturist and a dental technician with over 30 years of experience. So this is a real life experience, right, Mark? I mean, this is, this is you getting in there down and dirty, understanding uh, physiology, morphology, um, becoming a, 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 you know, a denturist that, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a um, a wet finger denturist, if you will, uh, which is very helpful for many of us on the U.S. side, which uh, we don't do a lot of denturists here. We we have pockets of denturists, but a lot of technicians that never have an opportunity to actually see their work, their end work, uh, is going to learn a lot from you. Uh, Mark owns and operates uh, his own dental lab uh, uh, called Heritage Denture Center. It's a, a clinic, if I, uh, I should say, as opposed to a laboratory in Edmonton, Canada. And it's his own uh, clinical denturist practice. Uh, Mark has spent his career focusing on how dentures integrate in the mouth. So it's not just slap it together, put it in, and hope for the best. Um, Mark actually makes sure that those dentures fit and fit well and is healthy for that patient which I'm sure all your patients are very appreciative of, Mark. Uh, he inspires a unique uh, awareness of occlusion and professional growth out of technicians, dentists, and other denturists. So, Mark, I am going to turn it over to you and let you introduce however you'd like. So you are now the presenter. I have assumed control. You have. Okay. Okay. Um, can so I can see, see you. Uh, I can see your uh, PowerPoint as well. Awesome. All right. We look good. Good morning, good. everybody. I look good. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. You do look good, even with a tie. I wore a tie today. All right. Good morning, everybody. Woot, woot. We do not slap teeth together. Welcome. Thanks for taking a moment. Thanks for, for, 
thank you for taking a moment out of your busy days to share and spend time with me and with Vita. So thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity as well and the invitation from Vita. And thanks, Jim, for all of your behind the scenes work. So good morning. We would like to talk about class three bilateral. This is complex treatment care. It's not often taught. Uh, typically, it's a uh, rule of thumb and you learn it out in the street in the lab. It's not taught in schools and, and, and typically it causes us a lot of extra work and, and they can be difficult and unfortunately unsightly as well. This is about adapting ourselves to a patient. This isn't about me. This is about the patient sitting in my chair. This is what they need from me. I want to share with you some life experiences and, and some things that have worked really well for me now clinically that I don't see a crossbite case now as a problem. I see it as it's just an it's just a case, it's that person, and I have the tools and confidence now to approach that case. It's like it's okay, we can do it. What I'd like to do is just run through a quick PowerPoint first to do some explanations, and then we'll go and uh, do the live demonstration and, and show you some things. So again, thanks for showing um, interest and, and taking time to, to, to learn. So I do appreciate that. This is about being a superhero for a patient. Whether you see that patient directly or not, there's a person that's placing their trust in a practitioner and all the people behind the scenes. And this is about being a superhero for that patient. That's what keeps our stress level down. That's what grows trust. And that's what builds a practice. So crossbite is considered complex treatment care. Our common issues with dentures are denture teeth chip, break, and pop off. Patient can't chew well with the new denture. Uh, the new denture is more loose than the old set. So they always say, well, how come the old one fits better than the new one? Uh, we've relined it multiple times with no success. Uh, the denture is breaking. Food collects under the denture, even though a reline isn't warranted. And the new denture feels too big compared to the old one. Of course, soreness and a temporary implant denture is preferred over a permanent. We see those issues a lot clinically. These issues cause us stress, uh, whether you're clinical or whether you are in the lab and the case comes back often and uh, usually um, sometimes I've seen the little unhappy smile emoji uh, that uh, this is the third time this has been relined this year. Uh, those are the cases that we need to take a moment, um, collect our thoughts. Uh, as for a dental technician, pick up the phone, contact the dentist and, and sort through and work the problem. I, I, I have had to use with uh, this comment with some patients, please understand I did not get up this morning to ruin your day. So we are trying to work the problem and sometimes the mouth can be a very difficult place to work in. It's, it's hard and it can be hard on us. So these issues cause us stress. And now it's compounded with a class three jaw relationship. So it makes it even more difficult because we don't see this as often in our daily routine. And we do get in a routine. Um, many, many of us do a lot of setups a day and we can do them and we're efficient at it. And then these, these ones come uh, and show themselves and it slows us down and takes us more time because they're more difficult and it's not part of our regular routine. So crossbite is defined is, is a form of malocclusion where a tooth or teeth are more buccal or in lingual position than their counterpart. So it is, we consider it in dentistry as a form of malocclusion. So it's either closer to the cheek or to the tongue than its corresponding antagonist of the upper or the lower arch. So in other words, crossbite is a lateral misalignment of the dental arches. So isn't that interesting is that we use the word uh, malocclusion that have the perception of saying it's not normal and then in reference to tell a patient that your situation isn't normal. But you look at yourself and go, but this is me. Uh, I'm normal. Well, we consider it abnormal. So I, I like to, to refrain from using those words clinically now. In a, in a webinar and in a course, um, we, this is how we identify it. But it's not, it's not that the person is misaligned or has malocclusion. Nature finds a way. They were born this way. And it's very interesting. This is an example. This is a patient, this is, pardon me, not a patient. This is a, a person that 
took one of my courses and they consented to photographs. They have crossbite. Uh, this is a nice, lovely young lady. And when you see all of her features put together, everything matches for her. Nature sorts itself out. Who are we to change what nature has done? Meaning, your crossbite, your crossbite. There are some things that we just can't get away from. So when you look at these pictures and you look at the situation in her mouth, what nature did was nature put teeth together. She can function, she can eat, she has no problem eating, her temporal mandibular joint is functioning without pain. Things work in her mouth. All nature did was reorientate the teeth to make it work. Now, how they got into this position, that's another topic for another day. What's important to look at are some of the key features of these photographs, is that when you look at the second bicuspid or the second lateral, its buccal cusp isn't overhanging its counterpart like you would typically see, it's turned inwards. So now the buccal cusp is nestling into the distal fossa of its lower counterpart. Nature finds a way to still have contact, nature finds a way to maintain that contact, and nature finds a way to, to, for the entire system to function for that individual. And that's what the brilliance of this. In school, what we would typically do was we would, again, crisscross the teeth, so the lower right becomes the upper left and such and so forth. To, to make a correction, but now you've got lower teeth on the upper and upper teeth on the lower, and it doesn't look good. When you see pictures of her, her, her teeth are aligned in, into what we look for, the wet and dry line and, and things of that nature. And she has a smile, it matches her face, it matches her features. And when you look at this now holistically, it doesn't look crossbite on her smile. Things look good, she looks quote unquote normal. Yet we look at her and say, yeah, but you're abnormal on the inside. So what I wanted to do is to show these pictures to say, when you look at this, she doesn't have a lot of, when you look at her teeth, you don't see a lot of wear marks or wear facets. You can see that her teeth have anatomy to them. There are some things that still matter. Those things are is that the teeth are a point load system. They're um, like a mortar and pestle. They're not milling. The occlusion isn't destroyed just because she has a lateral misalignment of the dental arches. Things still function for her. And that's really cool to show us, okay, when we have a denture patient, what do we do? So crossbite considerations is that sometimes it appears unesthetic because we have to use denture teeth not designed for crossbite. And so that's where it becomes difficult because we're using teeth that aren't designed for it. We typically have to grind them and things are just tedious for us to try and set up and make it work. Or we have to do the crisscross where again, the bottom ends up on the top and the top ends up on the bottom, which doesn't, Again, it's outside the operating parameters and how the teeth are designed to, to look. So it's usually not designed for it. It's contraindicated. Uh, we have different ridge sizes and it becomes difficult for us because we're looking at a situation on an articulator that we're not used to seeing and it throws our eyes off. And so it makes it more difficult. It's not often taught and discussed and typically you just have to uh, work your way through it. And so there's a lot of usually a lot of tooth grinding involved and it's just tedious until today. So I want to share with you what I've experienced and, and what I've done to make things easier in your life and reduce your stress level, yet still provide a product to the patient that doesn't look crossbite and looks aesthetic for that person so that they don't have to have bottom teeth on the top and top teeth on the bottom, which is counter counter looking for that person. So number one, we want to look and assess our patient. Again, we want to see their smile lines and, and their jaw and their jaw size. You want to see facial form and appearance and the movement of the mandible. So the movement of the mandible, again, is having the patient speak days of the week, months of the year in English and their mother language. And you're watching to see how much their mandible moves. 
So that's going to help you with in terms of how much movement there is and what their chew cycle is. Speech considerations as well, because typically the arches are misaligned, which means misalignment means they're different sizes than what we would typically see. But then always understand that nature finds a way and their tongue and their muscle structure has been adapted to that skeletal situation. Okay, take pictures as well, just as a reference point for you as well, just to have that when you're doing the setup. And you it, should you be altering it? So this comes back to, we don't slap teeth together. We don't do that. We don't slap teeth together. This is a, we have a very difficult job because we have to make teeth fit we have to make a denture fit for that patient. It has to aesthetically look good and it has to function and it sits on soft movable tissue. So with that said, you always have to ask yourself, should we alter it? So freedom and centric. So we wanna talk about what freedom and centric is because that exists in all patients, regardless of your jaw classification, class one, two, or three, regardless if it's cross bite, you have freedom and centric. And freedom and centric is the flat area in the central fossa upon which opposing cusps contact and permit a degree of freedom in eccentric movements, uninfluenced by the tooth incline, which means it can wiggle back and forth while you're in centric. So it's not locked together. And we can see that in, and again, regardless of the patient's jaw relationship, so what's important is that freedom and centric doesn't go away because our temporomandibular joint isn't locked together either. It does flex from side to side and from front to back. So do the teeth side to side, front to back while you're holding in centric. That's really important. So what that looks like on an articulator. So let's show you freedom and centric teeth. You can see it can wiggle side to side and now here's your inclines. So that's our classic working and balancing. And then there's that degree of freedom in there. So this is a, a, a normal-ish class one setup and I'll use normal in parentheses that it, to show and prove the point that what there's a lingual cusp in the center fossa of the lower. And that what controls freedom and centric is the lower and the central fossa of the lower. Now I can easily take this and put a buccal cusp into that fossa and it's the same thing. We'll still have freedom and centric. Freedom is that ability to move and go side to side and everyone freedom is good. You can't take the freedom away. When you do that, you create an interference in the denture where the cusps are gonna contact the guiding planes upon closure and the denture rocks. It is the rocking and the hit and slide that is the majority of our problems with denture construction and denture issues and fabrication. Remember, you are asking a patient to bullseye land centric every time that they touch. Now you have to think about this. You are asking a denture patient that has no nerves to the denture teeth. They can't physically feel the upper and lower teeth touch together because there's no nerves to them. fossa that's where you have that degree of freedom the green are the guiding planes i highlighted that so that you can see the guiding planes that's where you don't want the hit and slide there has to be a little bit of that wiggle room in there regardless of the situation so our natural teeth are like a mortar and pestle they're more like a point load system so that's what you don't want to have happen is the hit and slide because that's what's going to tip and rock the denture and then cause our problems. That's, that creates the ill fit, the sores, the breakage, the chipping, 
all of those things because remember the patient can't feel the denture teeth themselves like we can with real teeth and natural teeth we know if there's a misalignment or you know if there's a seed in your teeth and you can feel it immediately so then you know you can make corrections those inputs are always being put back to the central nervous system so it always knows where your jaw is positioned denture patient loses that perception and that's harder on the denture integration into the body because it, now your muscle system isn't working with the same degree of accuracy that what we do with real teeth so we have to compensate for that so these are regular contact points in a class one with beta lingual form teeth. Now I want to be clear, lingual form is, a, is, a, is, a, is a based on lingualized occlusion. That's the teeth that we're going to be using today. But you can set these teeth in more of a classic working and balancing situation. You don't have to tip, say, the buccal cusp up to really expose the lingual side of the tooth or the lingual cusp. It's a point load system. So the red dots is the cusp that's going to go into the fossa, which is the black dot that you see majority on the lower. So the red fits into the black. And if you notice for the first bicuspids or the first premolars, it is reversed. Okay. But the main chewing teeth, remember, are the molars. So you've got the red lingual going into the black dot fossa of the lower. The green is, again, you don't want the hit and slide. So those are where the guiding planes exist. And the guiding planes, you don't want the hit and slide on. So that's a typical class one. That's what we want to typically see. In a class three, it gets reversed. So if you look at this photograph now, what you see is now the upper buckle will nestle in to the lower fossa because the jaws now have reversed sizes on us and the lower is larger. So all you do is instead of placing the upper lingual cusp into contact with the lower fossa, all you do is just use the same teeth, you're just moving them over. That's how simple crossbite becomes. You don't have to now use different teeth for special teeth all you have to do is take it and put a different cusp that nestles into the fossa of the lower. That's how simple this will be. And this is what I will show you. Your, your, your time is now reduced in terms of setup and in terms of stress and in terms of grinding. You just have to pay attention that we still, the freedom exists. Because remember, the freedom exists in the lower fossa, and you just have to make sure that the guiding planes aren't going to, to hit and are going to interfere with each other. So that's all we're going to do today is just place a different cusp in than what we would normally do. So side by side now, all you can see is the difference, where again, on the cross bite on the left of your screen, the buckle is the majority of what's going to come in in contact. And on regular situations, and I'll use regular in parentheses, it's typically the lingual that comes into the fossa. That's all we're going to change. You don't have to crisscross teeth. You don't have to do a lot of the extra things that we have because the, the concept of lingualized occlusion works well for crossbite because it's just putting a different cusp into the position. Now, granted, some considerations are, remember, instead of the upper lingual cusp which is thinner or excuse me thicker you have you're putting in the buccal cusp which is a little bit thinner so it there's just some subtle differences to it however you just again the flow and the bite and the chew cycle all stays the same all we're doing is just putting a different cusp in so it becomes much less stressful for us so what's important is now beta teeth are designed like a mortar and pestle so they're designed where you have a cusp that sits in a fossa and it touches the fossa and it crushes food. One of the big changes for me in my practice is we, we would typically deal with patients commenting that they have a lot of trouble eating less lettuce and salads with typical denture teeth. And now I have virtually eliminated that problem from my practice from using lingualized teeth. And again, I want to be clear, you can set lingualized beta teeth 
in more of a working and balancing so you don't see that lingual cusp hanging like they would typically do. It hides itself really nicely. These are crushing teeth. Most other denture teeth on the planet that we use, so 20 degree, for example, is more like a mill. It's a milling principle. That's why there's contact through the tooth front to back and from buccal to lingual and the teeth have to come together. And, and again, as we were taught in school, hold together in centric and you would go milling. What's happening now with uh, the mortar and pestle is it comes into centric and crushes. You don't need the mill because now it lifts out of position. You just have to make sure it doesn't touch the guiding planes as it comes. Yes, the teeth will function in a, a working and balancing situation. So on an articulator, you'll see lingualized occlusion work and balance, but that's not how they're gonna function in the mouth. They're gonna function where they come in and crush. Whereas with 20 degree teeth, you'll see that they have to contact to work because they have much shallower cusps. They're more of a milling principle. And this was a big aha moment for me, everyone, where I would struggle trying to understand school taught me this should be working and the patients coming back saying mark it's not working mark it's loose mark it's this it's that and i would say but my bite's right and 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 i remount it and i see working and balancing and everything ticks off of what i was taught and what should work yet the patient says it doesn't work and they have problems and it was frustrating and i was banging my head on the wall proverbially trying to figure this out. And I've taken my journey to try and understand that. And what, I've, what I have now come to is what I share with you today. Vita teeth, mortar and pestle approach. They're crush. It works in a chew cycle with a patient. You don't want the hit and slide. And these, the hit and slide is how 20 degree teeth have to work. They have to come in, into contact. And we thought at the time that that was good because, again, that's what would create the stability on the denture is if you have contact left and right with the working and balancing principle. But understand in the mouth, you've got food now and you've got some sort of a food such as a hamburger or something that the patient's eating on one side of their mouth. And now there's no working and balancing going on. And they're trying to now mill the food, which is tipping the denture. So this is the issue, and this is where I had my aha moment in my career to understand, oh my gosh, we're, we thought about this incorrectly and I need to reapproach. So what I'm lecturing on, on today is, is different. It's different than what I was taught in school. I branched away from that foundational base to really look at how a denture patient eats and how they chew. So these are some of the critical points. Number one, you have freedom. There has to be wiggle and centric. You can't have it locked together. And I will be clear again, most denture teeth on the planet are locked and centric. There's only a handful of teeth that have this principle where they are free and centric. And 20 degree teeth are not. They do not have that incorporated into them. And so what's important use has that in it. The second thing I learned is remember, Denture patients can't feel their teeth touch together. So I would always tell a patient, Kate, touch together, please. Bite together, tap, tap, tap. Mark, what are you thinking? They can't feel that. They can't feel their teeth tap together like you do. So I, I started to realize, again, my journey with denture integration into the body, that they can't feel that with their nerves. They have to use other senses and other understandings to see when, and feel when their teeth are touching together. It's not as accurate. Yet we use teeth that are very accurate because 20 degree teeth have to work in a certain parameter or they don't function. And now with the mortar and pestle approach, where again, Vita teeth are crushing, 20 degree teeth are milling. It's a much different um, action in the mouth. And the milling has to work side to side and that's what rocks the denture. So again, now when you look at a still frame of this, that's a mortar and pestle approach. And I can tip the buckle and move it and, and, and make it look less lingualized. But what's important is that we have a stronger lingual cusp that does the crushing. And in a crossbite, all I'm going to do now is put the buckle into its place. So 
considerations, remember now we're not locking in the bite. We're gonna still put a driver into the bowl, as I call it. We're still gonna put a cusp into a fossa. The fossa has the freedom. Remember, freedom is good. We need that. And remember, again, the side shifts. Now remember too, because now it's not locked together, we can turn the teeth well as well to suit the situation of the patient, which I will show you. So these are some things that have been uh, outstanding for me now professionally to handle situations. Again, I always like to talk about professional happiness and freedom and centric, that the World Health Organization has listed burnout in its classification of diseases in 2019. Many of us have been in this profession and, and have been dental technicians and denturists and dentists for a long time. And you do, you get the same complaints from people and it wears you down because again, it's difficult to correct it or the patient just stops coming back. And then we wonder why denture adhesive sales are where they're at. It's like $150 million a year industry just in the US alone because people get tired of a loose denture and that's why you see these advertisements on television as such. We can get people out of adhesive. You can get people out of soft liners. You can control the damages and the common issues that we experience because we're using teeth that aren't locked together and that we can customize to that person. That controls our burnout, everybody. Because again, you get disillusioned and I was there already at year 10 or year 15 of my career where it was like, this, this, is, this is it for me. This is what I have to look forward to for 30 more years or 40 more years of these complaints that come in when I thought that I was doing it right. And now I've controlled that. We can make it better. So re these repetitive problems wear you down over time and cause you stress and the patient's not happy. And you, then you have to talk the patient down and calm them down that they still maintain their trust in or the dentist in your lab. You're using denture teeth that aren't flexible to the patient's needs. And that's why, again, I sincerely ask that you try Vita lingual form teeth for these situations and for your daily care of how you, how you set teeth in cases. You can set them and it's a, it is a mortar and pestle point load system that will function and doesn't look like a lingualized occlusion unless you go out of your way to set it like that. And it's an excellent situation in these different situations that we deal with crossbite. Okay, freedom and centric is what has really helped me in my profession. So again, I sincerely ask that you try them and see. And I appreciate that they're going to be different than what you typically use, and it takes time for that change. So I always laugh, I use this example. I walk into my favorite grocery store and I know where that peanut butter is and I know where it is on that aisle. And then the stores change their setup and I walk right to where the peanut butter should be and I'm reaching my hand out and then there's pickles there. And then I go, I'm supposed to show you, we all get in a routine, okay? So again, so does the patient. So these are the uh, representatives. I just like to quickly put this up that these are your reps. So now since this is being recorded, you can always stop at this position uh, of the video and you can contact your rep. If you're outside uh, North America, then please contact and go onto the VITA global website to find your rep in your area, okay? So now I wanna show you and I'm gonna switch out. So bear with me and we're going to switch cameras and now I'm gonna show you the practical application. And Jim, I'm just gonna double check with you that this is popping up and you can see this. Yes, it is. We're nice. good. Now, if I turn the light on, is that too much glare? Or is that okay? Uh, I can see a little bit on the lower, but uh, yeah, that's okay. good. Let's do that. All right, everybody, thanks, Jim. Okay, so. As I said, so here's an example. It's an oversized plastic example here, okay? So typically, the, the first thing about lingualized occlusion is you think that this cusp has to be, the buckle has to be tipped up and the lower exposed. You don't have to because look at the size of this thing of how it's made 
so it can nestle in it's already showing itself we can keep the buckle down and keep it in an alignment that is indicative of what we see with more of a 20 degree setup so it doesn't look unsightly so this is the upper lingual goes into the lower fossa and then this system so again the freedom exists here out of the factory, the teeth come with about one millimeter of freedom on them so that this thing can wiggle about one millimeter. This is the cusp or the main cutter that nestles in and crushes the food in here. Okay. With that said, then I talked about the hit and slide. So you don't want the guiding planes here to be the hit and slide. That's not good. So that's why we have that degree of freedom so that as the patient chews and as it comes into position, it doesn't hit and slide because it's not all locked together with so little tolerance. Now, in a setup of crossbite, All we're going to do is put this cusp into position. So I apologize that the, the cutouts rep, don't represent so well, but all we're going to do is put this in instead of the lingual, you go over to the buckle. And in some cases, we just have to watch the guiding planes here because remember, this is a narrower cusp, but it's still the cutter cusp like a mortar mortar and pestle that still exists that's not going to change so hi so remember we have a degree of freedom so freedom is good our teeth touch together and we have a little bit of freedom from side to side all that we're doing is we have a chew cycle so my jaw is moving and I identify that with the patient by saying days of the week and months of the year. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Look at my jaw. How is it moving? January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Now, my tracking is fairly straight and it doesn't move a lot. Some people, you can see them, they'll start to talk and their jaw shifts over and they move when they talk. Then that tells you that the whole system's moving. You need to now modify how those guiding planes will work so that they don't interfere and you don't have the hit and slide. So again, I'm going to switch back and come back down. So that's what we're going to be doing here is you just put the buckle in it still has freedom we have some models these are crossbite models and I want to quickly run through model analysis with you. So what model analysis does is it shows us the orientation of where the teeth should be. And typically in a crossbite situation, you're going to find that your tolerance level with model analysis is more, as I'll call it, like a straight line, which means the teeth have to go into a, a we don't have a lot of wiggle room in terms of how you can set the teeth because the lower jaw is, is larger than the maxillary. There are some things that hold true for us with model analysis. So the first thing that we will always do is we circle the incisive papilla. And on this model, it's pretty hard to see. So we encircle the incisive papilla. And then behind it is the rugae. So you'll see it here. So that's the long branch rugae. Okay. And what's interesting is you'll see this little wow here. So this person has a, has a deviation actually skeletally. Okay. And again, our tuberosities. 
are a little bit, again, different. And different is okay. So at the end of the Long Branch Rougay, so my apologies, I should have drawn that a little nicer. This is where you'll see the tip of the cuspid should be roughly for this person. Okay. Now on the lower, and I'll turn it this way for us, we will be circling the retromolar pads. And again, when you set the denture teeth, you'll be setting them one half, two thirds, or full height of the retromolar pad, depending on the situation and the fox plane check of the patient. So Vita teeth will be able to be set at different heights and different uh, relationships to the retromolar pad, which is fine. Next on model analysis is we look for our buccal frenum. And typically our buccal frenum is right where the arch starts to turn. So it's right on here. And that is where the first premolar or first bicuspids typically go plus or minus about a millimeter of tolerance, depending on bone loss. So typically, again, we're taught in schools to set teeth over the crest of the lower ridge. Uh, I do not follow that um, at all. I don't, my teeth don't always sit over the crest of the lower ridge. That they don't always set over the crest of the lower ridge. So why not? So what we do, according to, again, model analysis based on the teachings of Gerber and the TIF program, we've identified where the first premolar sits, and I go to the outside border of the tuberosity, and I draw a little line. And now I go from the, again, same point, and I go to the inside, and I draw a line. So actually what I've identified, everyone, is the functional zone limit of this quadrant of this arch, not based on what this physically looks like to us, because we don't know where the bone is underneath this. This is just what it looks like from the flesh perspective, not from the bone underneath. So what we're doing is we're identifying the skeletal zone limit of where the bone mass should be by using model analysis. So what Gerber did is he saw that when you follow this type of markings, what you're identifying is where you'll find the most critical bone mass and the limits of where you want to set the teeth. So we can do that for both arches on both sides. Okay, so we set. So using again, the position of the premolar to the outside limits and the insides limits of the retromolar pad. And then what that actually does for us is that created this triangle, which is again, the zone limit for that specific arch where you can set the denture teeth within. And then remember, they're gonna be loaded in the center of that tooth so that I actually can, as I see fit, can maybe move the teeth so long as, again, I'm falling within that zone limit, that's important. Now, typically, we'll also do that for the upper, where I again go from where the cuspid would be to the inside part of the tuberosity and to the outside portion of the tuberosity. And I facilitate a line on the model for both sides. So I've identified then in total four triangles for that patient. These are the four individual working triangles. So imagine the working triangles of this patient based on the skeletal relationship. Now, the other thing I wanna share with you is we are all, we are all uh, matched mathematically. So we're all golden proportioned. So when I said bigger lower jaw and it's in crossbite, it's mathematically related to the upper, which is again, mathematically related to my nose, my eye position, 
everything in my skull you can equate back mathematically. And so the whole thing's golden proportioned together. So it, it's done that to fit. We are all golden proportioned. Now, true artists understand that, like David's Michelangelo, the pyramids. These are all perfect mathematical golden proportioned, where the height is in proportion to the width and the length and et cetera as you go through. So we're golden proportioned. So that's what model analysis is identifying is the golden proportion rules of the skeletal system that we don't necessarily see. So that's the brilliance of this, is that it's identifying that through anatomical landmarks for us so that when we set things, we're gonna set it within the golden proportion of that person. So what happens now is these models are gonna go onto an articulator. And if I turn the articulator around, you'll see that I have the markings and let me just redraw them on this quickly here. So you can see that we have the lingual markings now on the posterior side of the models. So let's, let's examine that quickly of what that means. So again, we've identified the zone limit for each arch. I've identified that with lines. Now, what do we do? Okay, with that said, let me flip this over. We'll draw our upper. Because I'm going to draw it out on paper for you so that you can see it easier. Now, crossbite, the lower is slightly bigger. And we've drawn our lines here. On the model. So according to the TIFF program and to Gerber, what we're going to do is, I had earlier said that you can set within that triangle and that's fine for that zone limit. So you'll see the tooth and then I'm point loading and I can go anywhere within that limit. But now we want to blend the limits. So this is my fundamental issue with setting teeth over the lower crest of the lower ridge. Because when you set teeth over the crest of the lower ridge, when you set teeth over the crest of the lower ridge, so there's the tooth, lower ridge, tooth goes over it, the upper will have to go here because remember they're made to fit together. It makes no, no, discrep no orientation, no consideration for where the upper rests against the upper ridge, does it? None. So you fundamental problem with that now and my problem is is because why does the lower get to dictate where the teeth go well you say ah but mark it's stability well remember if the upper isn't stable then it's going to affect and circle back that the lower isn't stable and it's it's you get into this vicious circle where we've got a, a lower denture that fits well but the upper was always loose and then i was always relining the upper and trying to get the upper to fit and then the upper was still loose so this is why they both work together. They have to because they function in the same system together. So what we're doing is we're identifying now through this, through my lines. So we can set all the way out here. That's fine for the lower. But as you can see, look, it's too, it's too far for the upper. So I'm going to bring my ruler over and I'm going to say, there's my stop line now. So it's there. And now, I can set all the way here. It's it's fine for the upper, but it's exceeded this lower. That's not good for it. So now I bring this lower up, and this becomes that zone limit that I can set the teeth now within. So if you imagine this zone limit in regards to this, you imagine now that zone limit I can set teeth within that little zone limit here, looking at it horizontally, irregardless of what this shape is, it's gonna function both for the upper and lower. And that's, that's the beauty of this. And what you typically see, if we look at this side, okay here, not okay here. So this line comes up, good here, but not good for us. So on cross bites, you'll see that this line is usually very, very, very thin. So that's the blend of both lines together so that this system 
functions together while the patient is chewing and that lower jaw is chewing, that's where it becomes critical when you look at this and the patient's trying to chew, these have to work together and stabilize each other out because they're functioning in the same system. So typically on crossbite, this line becomes very narrow. That's why lingualized occlusion works really well because again, it's a point load system. So the teeth point load on them. So again, to remember, you have a picture of the upper. So again, on a crossbite situation, there's your, your, your cutter. And that's gonna nestle into the lower, the fossas there. So if I take the teeth off the card and show it to you, and my apologies on the camera issue, but I picked two different colors to, to show the example. Into the fossa of the lower, so the upper buccal cusp instead of the lingual. So turning it, so my apologies again. It's always easier to do this in a hands-on course live, which I hope we can do again one day. That's all it looks like. And then that little gapping is the freedom. So my apologies, it's hard to show freedom, but these teeth actually glide side to side. That's what it's going to look like. Neat, hey? So. Now as I carry on, let's flip this back. All right. So I've said absolutely nothing controversial, have I? Uh, geez, uh, don't set teeth over the crest of the lower ridge. Well, I thought on model, model analysis, which is accurate. Uh, I use uh, lingualized occlusion for crossbite cases. Uh, okay, uh, that's not controversial. And oh, and by the way, um, we also uh, do a point load system in mortal and pestle instead of milling, which is what we were taught in school. So I appreciate your patience and I appreciate an open mind because what I'm teaching you has been now 34 years of my professional career. I'm 51 currently. I started caring for patients when I was 15, uh, sorry, 17. So it's been 34 years of my life. And this is my struggles when I left school, armed with knowledge, thinking that I knew what I was doing and ran into these situations and these problems and then started to think, wait a minute. And so began my journey that I'm sharing with you. I've had a long time to try and perfect this journey and change with it, within this journey. And I'm now bringing it to your attention very quickly to say, well, geez, he does it quite a bit different than what I've been taught. Yes, I have. But now my adjustment rate has dropped. The complaint level has dropped. I don't see chipping. I've virtually eliminated denture teeth chipping from my practice, even on implants, because I have paid more attention about how that denture integrates, the chew cycle, the freedom and centric principles that I'm sharing with you of, of why that works for me now. So. A little bit of a readjustment. Now we can start to set teeth in. So when you set teeth, typically I like to, again, I've pieced this out for us, but typically I'll always cut away the rugae and, and such so that I can see that again, the rugae and the dot will always be in in relation of plus or minus a millimeter of where the cuspid sits, okay, um, on the cape. So I like to cut that out to show that. So what I will do is place some pieces together here for us. So I'm going to take the upper anterior teeth off and we're going to go right to the posterior teeth here. And I'm going to close it into contact for us. And I'm going to flip it. So I preset things because I think it would be tremendously boring to watch me set teeth. And I have no mood music while I'm trying to orient teeth together. So what I've done is I've preset it for us. 
So what's important is I would like to show about how these teeth are set on this side for us at the moment. So typically what we're going to see is this cusp is going to, that's the buccal cusp of the lower, it's going to start and nestle in to the mesial fossa here of its counterpart. So what we're going to see is that's a little bit more, let me just close it in, thank you, of a standard arrangement of what we're going to see like a class one. The crossbite starts here on the second premolar or second bicuspid and then into the molars which are crossbite. So if we look at it horizontally, you can see that there's a slight little wow developing here. And that's typical because again, we've got the lower nestling here, but all of a sudden now we're using this cusp and this cusp to be our cutters because of the crossbite. So again, it's this cusp that comes into the upper, but now again, we have the corresponding into the fossas here. So my comment earlier now that we're able to actually turn these teeth clockwise, counterclockwise, because of the fact that it's not locked into centric, we actually can turn and rotate the teeth to now hide this little discrepancy that you see here. I can actually rotate that first premolar and change things a little bit to help hide that for us. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Okay, so let me bring that up close for you. So what's happened is, and let me turn so you can try to get the down the angle. So what happens here specifically, you can see that the buckles are in the lower, the upper buckles are in the course class one relationship of where we would have it overlapping the other way. Of course, this isn't going to line up as well, but that's what you would typically see. But now it's this way. Well, I'd like to draw that out for you so you can see that a little easier on the camera. So here's the fossa. So we're going to color those in black. So that's where we're shooting. To have the cusp come in. Now on the upper, remember it's the buckle, so I highlight that in red. And that is what's going to come in and contact for us on this side. So now this patient will chew with a chew cycle. So it's the upper buckle cusp that becomes the cusp that's going to cut and chew and mince and crush the food. So all we've done is flipped it. Flipped it meaning I've just gone, instead of the lingual touching, so instead of that lingual being the mortal and pestle, now it's the buckle. So all we have to watch is when this functions that we don't have those guiding plane contacts in there. That's how simple this is. I don't have to now, again, crisscross teeth, grind a lot. I just have to watch the guiding planes. What you'll see as well is you'll see these little gaps in here. That's what we want to see. I want to see these little gaps or these little spaces in here. Why? We're so used to being taught in school with 20 degree teeth that everything is really heavily contacted together. And I'm gonna say in my experience now, that doesn't work that way in the mouth. It's there, you can't have that so much full contact because that's what creates the tipping and the movement of the denture. You want these little spaces, one, for freedom, two, for compensation, for flexibility, three, the food has to stay on the teeth to get chewed. If you have really tight contact together, 
like we saw with 20 degree teeth where they're very knuckle tighted together. Where does the food go when the person bites together? The food gets pushed off. Now, granted, you could say, ah, oh, well, Mark, there's little slew ways and, and, and these, these little divots. So, so here's some 20 degree teeth. And you can say, well, yeah, well, these teeth are made to be really tightly put together. Very little gapping on these things. There's very little tolerance on 20 degree teeth. We need that tolerance in the mouth. We need that spacing so the food has somewhere to sit while it gets crushed by the opposing cusp. That's why you have a cusp. The cusp is what cuts. So it's a little bit of a different way of thinking this out and thinking how does a patient chew and how does a senior citizen chew. In relation to that, everyone. Hi. In relation to that, you have to keep in mind, most dentures are built for seniors. So most seniors are on medications. Medications cause dry mouth. That affects how the dentures are lubricated in the mouth, which is a major problem. As we get older, our muscle tone and our effectiveness and sharpness also starts to deteriorate. So we're not as accurate as we were before, which means our tactile touching, we, we just are, are, unfortunately, our nervous system does degrade over time. So we're not able to touch into centric in the same manner as we did in our younger days. Yet we put denture teeth in that are locked together that don't have any degree of freedom. And now we're trying to incorporate this into a crossbite case where it becomes difficult for that patient to reproduce centric as they get older. And we expect them to be able to hit that bullseye every time. It, it doesn't happen. Now that I'm showing you through the PowerPoint and now through samples, the fossa, so the black dot area, is what the freedom is built into. The corresponding cusp sits into said fossa, has that degree of freedom to wiggle, and then the chew cycle develops regardless of, of whether it's crossbite or not. You've got to watch the guiding planes of that bowl. And now the patient can chew and there's less rotation of the denture because it's not all contacting where 20 degree teeth are designed and have to mill the food. So you're physically designed a tooth that has to go on a horizontal approach and that in turn rocks the denture. Where this and what I'm showing you with the Vita teeth is a mortal and pestle coming in, slamming in it doesn't have to mill. So there's less rotation on the denture. So again, I virtually eliminated soft liners from my practice. Whereas before I'd be buying oodles of soft liner. I have virtually eliminated that now from again, going to occlusion and understanding how the denture integrates into the body, how it integrates for a senior citizen, which is different. And now the freedom and centric. Use. If you allow me again a moment, I'm going to reset the camera and I'm going to show you this other side. So I've set the teeth on the other side slightly different because every situation in the mouth is a little bit different for us. And it's hard in a course because you, you are taught one way and then you go back to work on Monday and all of a sudden it's, well, wait a minute that was different than what I learned. So I want you to, to, I'd like to again show what I did different here. And for those with the sharp keen eye, you'll see right away, this I've put into crossbite right away. Whereas before I didn't, on the other side, this cusp was touching into this. See what happens when you try to do things on a camera. This buccal cusp, thank you, was going into this mesial fossa here. Now look what I've done. I don't have that. I actually have gone into crossbite right away. I've got this buccal cusp into the distal fossa of its lower counterpart right away. And the entire rest of the case is crossbite right away. So what that does 
is that's eliminated that little wow but you can't do that on every patient for example it depends where the crossbite starts for that individual person so sure i don't have the wow like i have on this side because this side i was able to put it in a more of a class one setting which is what we'd like to see and develop the crossbite over here Whereas on this side, I've, I developed the crossbite right from the first tooth. And that's the benefit and the beauty of these teeth. They allow for me to be, re, to be proactive instead of reactive. I can go right to the patient and say, okay, meaning the situation of the patient, and go right into, look, I'm in crossbite right away. So I'll show it this way. Let me go down. There we go. So it's a crossbite setup with all teeth right away. And I'll go posterior for you. So every situation is different. This comes back to my comment. There's not a right way or a wrong way. What I want you to do is to place a cusp of the upper into the corresponding or a corresponding fossa of the lower. Which cusp is really irrelevant? So long as it sits. Oh, it's like a mortal and pestle. Just stick a cusp into a bowl, please. However you need to do it for that person. That's what makes this work. And that's the beauty of this. This is a point load system. It is flexible to the needs of a patient. And I don't have to sit here and spend a lot of time grinding and, and wasting my time trying to make things work. What's nice is this teeth are proactive for me to go in and set them how I need them to set. So on one side of the situation, if I close up, there we go. So on one side, I've got crossbite developed right, right away. And on the other side, I don't have to. And then all I have to do is turn the teeth into position. Again, they're not knuckle tight so that they have freedom. There's room, room for the food to stay on and get crushed by the cusp. And again, to refresh memory as I'll draw it. So now it's all of the upper buckles that are my crusher into the fossas of the lower. And then here, here's where the fossas of the lower are. So it was slightly different. Whereas on this side, with lingualized occlusion, that was my cutter for the first buy. So that's on a normal class one situation. So I have great flexibility here to change and to go ahead. And let me get in close on that. And then this is the upper. So the only difference when when you go into crossbite right away, it does allow for a, a nicer linear line to develop. Where here I have to rotate the tooth a little bit to help hide that because it's a little bit of a reverse curve that gets developed because of the transition into crossbite. So then I'm turning this tooth. I have to turn it, okay, clockwise to again get rid of this little divot here as much as possible. So that then when you look at the teeth from a picture, excuse me, from a, a, a perspective of this, now imagine there's lips here and you've got the patient smiling. You can see the emergence profile of the teeth develop. So it looks like the normal smile. So think back to the PowerPoint and our file and emergence profile so if you look at the front teeth into position with it as well 
So I'll put that back into position and hold everything together. So my apologies. When I piece this out like this, but what it does is it helps create, you can see that little dip, so that's unfortunate, but part of the situation, okay? But we have that smile line so that then when I hold things and we go like this, you can see it's fairly like a class one. You don't see a lot of tips and turns slightly on this side, but again, I've turned that tooth to show this facial aspect more to help hide it. And that's why you do the turn so that the, you see the facial aspect so it keeps that profile more so it doesn't look like there is a discrepancy in the mouth. Okay? So that's the beauty of using the Vita teeth and the concepts now that I'm speaking to because it's allowed me to set the teeth up without having to spend a lot of time grinding them and now from the perspective of I would go in and I'm looking now as I mark in green, so green is always the freedom, I'm trying to now watch the guiding planes. So the guiding planes is where we go into occlusion the green is where I don't want to have a lot of the contact areas. Why? Because of the hit and slide. So the hit and slide causes the damage. The hit and slide is the issue. Now, typically, on an articulator, again, we open the articulator, and how we're taught in school is to check like this. That's very common for us to do this. I challenge you all to look at people when they eat. So when you go home tonight, you have my permission to go home and look at the person you're sitting across from at the table. Let's rotate that and watch the meat because I will say they don't move like the articulator moves and a denture patient doesn't. I've brought in denture patients and have taken a uh, great time of watching them eat different kinds of foods to watch how that system works when you don't have the tactile of, of having the nerves and the teeth touching. And now we check like this in the lab and I will say that that is under no representation whoops, of how that works in the mouth check like this what I'd like you to do is to pick up and I want you to facilitate a chew cycle like this now that patient's chew cycle will either be more horizontal or it can be more vertical that's why I'm asking you to, to ask them to speak days of the week months of the year so you can identify it and here goes the chew cycle and that's what I'm watching for is to now see, am I having any hit and slides along the guiding plane areas of the teeth? Now, typically we'll see them a little bit in here because remember this cusp is thicker because this was designed on a class one principle. I'm turning it into a class three principle. So we might have a little bit of touching to do here, but that will be the extent of it. Now, in regards to the lower anteriors, so allow me a moment to reposition. So the only trick now is, again, here we've set it more like a class one, and here we have the crossbite out coming right away. So the transition of the crossbite will be in and around this cuspid here. So this is where it gets, can, can get a little bit tricky, is the how to make this with no gapping. And I've set it with gapping in place to show you that we do have sometimes a transition issue. So what has to happen is then I have to take and grind this distal aspect of this tooth down a little bit to nestle it into position Then I can close the gap up and I can transition into that cross bite using the cuspid. Then I got to check in the mouth to make sure that we don't nip the lip. That would be my consideration to bring to your attention. Whereas on this side, 
because this was set more with a class one and we've transitioned into crossbite only here in the posterior teeth, this orientation works quite easily and quicker because it's more like a class one situation for us. You don't have to pay as much attention to it. It goes a little quicker. Whereas on this side, you will fiddle slightly with it. But once you know then my tip, we're going to be grinding in here of the lower on the distal to then seat that back in and make that work. So it just depends because again, it's it's not always bilateral crossbite perfectly, even though this case is bilateral crossbite, the crossbite can flare on one side more than the other. So I've showed you two different ways. I've showed you with a class one approach here for the first bicuspid and a class three approach here with this bicuspid. You don't have to do that for each case. I would like to be clear, it's it's you have the flex to set them. Consequences of that, of course, is sometimes you have to use a larger tooth to make up that difference because you're going a little wider. So sometimes you have to use a little bit of a larger lower. But remember, the person's not showing as much lower teeth than the upper, so you can hide that a little easier. So sometimes I use a larger lower lateral and cuspid to hide that gapping because it's going to gap because this is flaring out more than the other side. In some situations, I can do a class one approach easily on both sides, and it's not an issue. Sometimes I have to do it right away. Both sides are class three on this first bicuspid or premolar. My point in all of this, again, is to reiterate, I have the flexibility with the teeth to go either way. It doesn't matter. Then that's the consequences for setting the lower anterior teeth. So in a hands-on course, we bring a lot of teeth with us to show you that we can swap out and go slightly larger just to help hide any gapping that you see, and it works. So it's not as critical as you think because the person is only showing usually the tips of the teeth and they're not gonna tell the size difference. So you have a great deal of flexibility to hide things. So Jim, I'm gonna uh, ask a question here for you. Do we have any questions okay. coming in that I can that I can answer at this point? Um, yeah, I mean the uh, what you just showed the lower end here. So just to be clear, do you use a completely different anterior mold, or are you speaking about you also mix individual tooth lower anterior tooth molds to fill that gap? Right. So thank you. So according, uh, when you use Vita teeth, they, they come with a mold guide, uh, and I typically will use the match, so the match for the lower mold to the upper. But again, to have the flexibility that, that if you get gapping, that's why, because it's not symmetrical, then I can use slightly larger teeth to help hide the gapping. So I'll go one size greater than what the mold guide would tell me. That's okay. Remember, it's only a guide. It's not a must because, again, what have I learned with treating patients, everyone and Jim, is this is anything but symmetrical in the mouth. And it depends on what you're eating and the age of the patient and their abilities and their neuromuscular system and how it's firing. So we're trying to make this work. The more freedom I put into this thing, the more tolerance, you can see the wiggle, the better it's going to be in the mouth. So again. I start with the recommendation from the manufacturer for the for the sizing. Larger teeth if I need to, to make up the difference because I have to. That answer the question you right. think, Jim? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so if, you, if you're ready to go more questions or are you? Uh, yeah. Do you, have, do you have some more? Yes. Um, I, because it's a good time. Uh, what, to stop. This is all. This always comes up. What were the markers? You want to show the marker name and where you, what those are? Well, of course. So here we'll use the red one. So I use Statler non-permanent. So you got to make sure it's non-permanent. Luma color. Made in Germany. Woot woot. 
So I use Statler. So this is readily available at uh, supply stores and, and office supply stores. You can also use uh, Sharpie non-permanent. That's fine. And then I use the different colors. So I have the green and, and the black. I use the different colors just, again, from a teaching perspective to show when we're doing this from an education perspective to, to mark things out so you can see it easier till you learn yourself how to how to look for it. So those are the markers, okay? Statler, Lumocolor. Okay, non-permanent. Right. Awesome, thanks Jim. Next question. And then uh, in general, uh, question is what mm. occlusal scheme do you recommend? Um, so what philosophy I guess would be what you would use, um, you know, curvature. Uh, it's kind of a general question, but right. what, uh, so, what occlusal scheme do you, do you recommend? So I Cur use you know, a certain curve, try do you stick with a curve of speed, curve right. of Wilson, do you? So I'll answer this generally and then specifically go into it as, as, I, as I develop my answer. I use Vita Lingoform teeth, so these teeth here, for just about 99.9% .9 of all the work that I do, period, now in my practice. And then I'm able to modify this to the patient. So in some way, shape, or form, whether it's in crossbite, whether it's in class two, class three, I use these and I modify them. I modify them to the chew cycle of the person and how their jaw is moving, and I can gently modify them. These teeth are acrylic glass. You do not have to polish them after you grind them. They self-polish, which is awesome for us. Because typically on acrylic teeth, like our good friends here, Dent Supply, you have to grind these things or you have to polish them after. You don't have to do that with acrylic glass. These are acrylic glass. 85% polymethyl. So I go in and I follow and I'm checking the modification of the chew cycle of the patient. So that's number one. Number two, I, am, I, I can modify to class two, class three, class one. When you physically set the teeth, so now I'm gonna resort back. When I set the teeth, to specifically answer the question, so let me take this lower out and do this for you. Take these out. Okay, you can set these lower teeth on a flat plane. I can set them on a 20 degree curvature plane. I can set the lowers first or I can set the uppers first. It doesn't matter. You don't have to change your setup. Principles of what you're used to already in the office and what you do. The key points are to understand that you're gonna put a cusp in a fossa. So you're gonna put a cusp in a bowl. I'm starting to identify those with you and mark them out for you so you know which ones go where. But at the same token, in Germany, they actually set teeth. And you'll see this in a lot of their photographs out of Europe. It's going to be hard for me to hold, so bear with me. But they actually set to a string. Now, I've used a, a string. They use a real thin thread. But now, for video purposes, I'm going to do this to show it to you on a thicker, thicker version to show it. So they're just, again, instead of setting on a template, they set visually, and they're looking to see where each cusp lies in relation to the thread. In North America, you'll see us set more to a template. So you can set to the upper or to the lower, it doesn't matter. And it's typically two thirds to full height of the retromolar pad. That's fine. The, the, the point I wanna bring to the internal design of the teeth is that there's actually a curve of speed built inside these teeth. So these little black dots, there's an actual, they actually change from tooth to tooth. There's an actual internal curve of speed. So if I set these, on a flat plane, all the 
the buccal and lingual cusps are touching on that flat plane, but the curvus B is actually curved inside the tooth. So it's actually pretty brilliant when you think about it, because this allows for flexibility for different setup principles in the world, depending on what you want to do. So the teeth will work depending on what flexibility you want. So they're flexible enough to work to what you want them to work for in the office. The reason why they do things are have that little bit of freedom. They've got that little bit of flexibility. That's why you can set them in different ways. That's the beauty of this. So again, I can set them with different setup principles because they're not physically locked together. They have that little bit of freedom, which allows me to do those things that I couldn't do with other products. Okay, Jim, next question. All right, so the next, yeah, so the next question is, is uh, if you use the lingual form teeth, are the palatal cusps longer? And if so, when you set in crossbite, do you need to adjust the length of the palatal cusp tips? Good question. So again, to, to reiterate, and I'll, I'll bring it down to this side here. So typically in crossbite, we're going to use, we're going to put these cusps into position. These cusps are narrower and thinner than, than the typical cusp that we'd see that we'd use for class one. So the answer is where I'm going to have to do the grinding is typically here on the guiding plane of that tooth because it's a thicker cusp. I rarely, I, I can't recall ever taking off the height because again, the tooth is tipped. So let me grab my plastic ones here. So, so rarely do I, well, yeah, I mean, it helps if I look at the picture too. Rarely am I having to take the height off of this. I'm having to take sometimes in here, rare here. Because again, it's crossbite, so this is what's keeping the tongue out of the way for tongue biting. So rarely am I having to do this. I'm not saying never, but I'm saying rare to answer that question. Because typically, again, the tooth is set. We either, this would be a normal class one position, but because we're going into class three, okay. Let's try that like this. Okay, normally that's on a class one position. Typically on a class three, we're like this. The tooth isn't, the tooth is set flat. That's why this is more out of the way. It's keeping again, the tongue out of the way so it doesn't get nipped, okay? So rarely am I having to touch this. Great question, and I love where you're thinking with it. Rarely, not saying never, but I'm saying rare. Okay, because- And then we- Go ahead, Jim. No, go ahead. Finish up. No, I was just gonna. I, my my comment was just in this type of a of a, of a diagram using this type of, of just show that again that would have been our class one that we would typically use it in. I've just flipped it this way, so again it's a thinner cusp. This is thicker, but remember the jaw's bigger, so that that accommodates for this being larger. So typically it works. Rarely would you ever have to again go in here and grind this because of a, of a space issue for the tongue. Because things are larger, the tongue will rest down here, it's fine. Okay, not saying never, but I'm saying typically it, it would be okay in my, all of my crossbite work that I've done. Awesome, next question. Excellent. So Mark, uh, question yeah. is, do you ever switch the upper and lowers so inverse them no never Use, not anymore never. i don't have okay. to. never not with lingual form never ever ever do i have to do that ever again and what again what's nice is that because and this is a class one setup everybody i can i can make again in crossbite with again the 
emergence profile of the teeth. You have to imagine that there sits in a frame with lips on it. I can change that, it, not change that. And here's my class three here. So my apologies, thank you for the wait. Again, imagine that there's some lips around this thing, okay? Rarely do I, I, I don't have to because I want that nice emergence profile coming through to again, give that person that nice smile line. So no, I don't flip. Not, not anymore because I don't have to with these teeth. So and you showed us. Go ahead. You, you showed us um, class three posterior. Yeah. It, can you go over quickly uh, how do you treat if you have a the anterior and then or crossbite class three on the anterior? What's your limits on that? Well, how do you handle that those type of situations, ridge relationships on the anterior? Excellent. Allow me to reposition. Okay, so this is back to our crossbite case. So I've gone crossbite here. Now, if if because now they're prognathic, so because it's crossbite here, now we're going say we're going prognathic. So I didn't set originally in that position. So if it has to go prognathic, it's going to it's going to go end to end, everybody. So it's going to be more of an end to end type of relationship. You're going to probably outside the recommendation of the mold guide you're gonna to have to go one to two steps larger and then typically it'll be an end-to-end -end approach and then typically what you're going to see is the upper rests like this and then again depending on the situation but that lower is going to be almost straight up and down because we're more prognathic, sometimes you might have to lean it a little bit if it's really prognathic, okay? And a lot of times then it's an end-to-end -end bite. But then what you see on these types of situations is there's not a lot of draw, which means when the patient talks, there's not a lot of movement this way. When they speak, it's, it's very more up and down and more vertical. You're not going to see that jaw posture forward a little bit because the way that the the size of the mandible and, and how it relates in the temporal mandibular joint is such that there's not a lot of movement front to back okay so i hope that answers that question typically then you'd have to go in with a larger lower anterior typically you're going in more end to end to facilitate the the cross bite and prognathic jaw relationship okay All right. Um, how do you avoid any typical anterior and sizal edge to edge contacts in a class three bite when the lower anterior is protrusive? Okay, could you say that again, Jim? So the question is how do you typically Please. avoid any anterior and sizal edge to edge contacts or interference when it's a class three bite? when okay. the lower anterior are quite angled outside, you know, um, pronathic yeah. angled so, out okay, for so an end to end. I, I appreciate that's a, uh, thank you for that uh, awesome technical question. It's gonna come down to then, um, t t okay. So typically we'd have to try to go to an end to end on that type of situation but I'm gonna be checking this in the mouth. And if I'm not the one checking it, meaning that I'm a dental technician asking the dentist, I'm gonna write them a note and hope they read it, that when they do the wax try-in, that they are checking it uh, with how much, again, draw that that patient has when they are enunciating, how much is that moving forward? Because the larger the mandible, the more prognathic it is, what you would again see is that there's very little movement front to back and that there, you're not gonna see that. So typically we can go lip biting, 
But remember, the mandible's larger, so you're going to have a larger lower lip. So in some cases, then I can set the teeth. So my bad drawing, there's the upper. Looks like a sock. Okay, let's try that again, everybody. But what a beautiful sock. I know. I make teeth for a living. Um, you can do this and, and have that little bit of gapping there so that the lip doesn't get caught in, in there. So it's it because of the prognathic nature of it. So I, I'm going to watch how that moves in the mouth. And you're going to then want to have the dentist to check that. If they don't check it or if you have to adjust it afterwards, then I would I would keep it so that this is a fairly level playing field like this. You're not going to put a lot of overlap on it, and and then again watch that so that you don't get the cheek or the lip biting in there. I appreciate that question. It's a difficult one to answer uh, with a camera, and and not be able to sit beside you in a classroom, which I can hope to do one day with you, and and play with the teeth and show it to you uh, in in a real time approach here, but understand that there are some limitations and we make these educated decisions on an articulator of how to make it work but really you have to go back to how does this work in the mouth so then i ask that as an insurist or a dentist you can check that visually if you're the dental technician and you're unsure then you have to write the note to the dentist of where to specifically check and if at all possible, take a video of it and then send the video of it of them speaking so you can see it and a close up video of those anterior teeth. And if they can't do that, then do a site visit if at all possible as well, if, it, if it's a case that's problematic. But a video should work to at least show you how much draw there is this way. I hope that answers the question. It's a long response on my part with my apologies. That's a very technical question uh, and difficult. Again, I apologize for my response uh, with the limitations of here um, in regards to, to a webinar. We have a very educated uh, customer market, so very technical. Nice. Yes, uh, and so I like it. And we have a few more questions, but I am going to um, show my uh, screen to kind of close this out, start closing it out as well. So I am, we still have you. I am going to uh, bring this up. I'll show my, my ugly mud, mug as well. So everyone, just a reminder, uh, as we get to the rest of the questions, uh, CE, if you if you are looking for CE, you're going to receive an email that kind of direct you to um, acquire the CE. Uh, so there's some additional work on your end to, uh, to capture that. The workshop was recorded, so you can go back and revisit it if you'd like. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, give us a day or two and we'll post it on our websites and those will be available. We also have many other uh, videos, how to. Mark's done several uh, webinars for us. Uh, they're all fantastic. They all have different uh, topics, themes, going to into different type of class. Uh, last time we did it was uh, a class two um, setup. This is class three. Uh, we've got more on the way. Uh, on uh, any help that we can give you from the from the uh, from Vita side, here are some numbers, some contact points that you can give us a call at or email us at. And then also uh, out in the field, we have uh, several Vita reps, including Canada. So if you need to seek out a, a local one of your local uh, Vita reps, uh, please do so. Contact us if you need to get a hold of that person as well. Uh, so. We're going to have more later this year with Mark. Uh, the next one is actually going to be uh, July 13th. It's a combination syndrome, so against natural teeth. So this is uh, another very useful, uh, applicable, real-life situation that Mark's going to go over with on July 13th. So I hope you will attend as well. And then we have other programs, uh, as you can see, listed there throughout the year. 
And then if you need to get a hold of Mark, here is his contact information. Please do so. Mark's gracious enough to actually uh, pick up the phone when you call him. So, Mark, I appreciate that, and thank you very much for uh, for helping the customers out if they have some follow-up questions uh, for you. I always ask that you allow me a day or two to get back to you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we expect you to answer within 10 minutes. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Just 10. Hey, our customers are uh, are professional uh, and and uh, very educated, so they need an answer. <laughs> no, Mark will get back to you as soon as he can. I mean, Mark is a practicing denture, so he has uh, patients that he sees every day, uh, pretty much twenty, uh, you know, twenty four seven. Uh, he's yeah. in demand, so uh, he'll he'll get back to you in a timely manner. Uh, so here, here's the uh, the rest of the Q and A. We have a question. Uh, uh, class three, do you always have the upper bulk of cusp uh, interdigitate with the opposing fossa, or do you sometimes land on a guiding plane? Is it always in the cusp, or do you have to fudge a little and move it? Okay, so so you can fudge a little bit on the premolars, but never on the molar. The molar is the main chewing tooth. So the first and second molar is, is where most of the chewing happens. So that's where I want that cusp into the fossa. You can fudge it a little bit on those premolars because that's not where most of the chewing happens. So yes, you can if you have to. Yes, you can. And sometimes what I've done is, is put a little bit of a divot into the guiding plane to facilitate the proper sort of connection so that it's, it gives it a stopping point. So yes, you can. Great question right. as well, thank you. And then we have um, someone saying freedom is great, which thank is always you. always nice to hear. That message uh, got out to him. Oops. And nice. then Jason Atwood would love to assist you in a in a, a workshop, so that might be in the future. And thank then we you. have uh, a question: Are the cases uh, you have to go outside the triangle tooth zone, right? Do, do, do you no. Fudge on that. No. Always. No. Okay. The, you can put a tooth outside that triangle, but it is a no function. So a part of the tooth can hang out there if it has to, so to speak, but you don't want any function outside that triangle because then it's going to cause the tipping. All right. That's good. Right, That's guys. good information. Nice. What about... Um, Class three, if you are opposing natural dentition. Same principle. Do you apply. follow? Yes. Do you follow that as occlusal scheme? You you? Yes. Yes. As much as you can with natural dentition. Yes, please. I will be using the uppers against lower natural teeth. I will set them into crossbite. And that's where you might have to grind a little bit because lower isn't, of course, the lower natural teeth won't be as perfectly designed as, say, a denture tooth would be. However, the same principles apply. You need to put a cusp into a fossa. So an upper cusp has to go into a lower fossa. And then you got to make sure that the guiding planes don't interfere so there's no hit and slide. That's it. So I make that, I make that a very matter of fact response. So you have a little bit of grinding possibly to do depending on the shape of the lower natural tooth. But in essence, it's that simple. Stick a cusp into a fossa make sure that the guiding planes don't hit and slide. And we certainly will cover more of that on your next uh, webinar uh, against natural teeth. Um, Maria has, um, in general, can you quickly go over your, your order of tooth setting? You know, which do you set up first? Which tooth right. do you set up first? My way, upper six anterior teeth. First, left and right upper premolars. Then I go to the bottom and I go to the lower. First, left and right lower first premolars or bicuspids. And then I do the lower posteriors. So left and right lower posteriors on each side. Then I do the lower anterior. And then I do the upper posterior last to allow for the wax to cool. And then that's 
that's where I do the upper last because those are the function teeth. So that's how I would set it for me. And if you join me in a course, that's how I would teach it in the course. But again, I always say, it's not how you have to do it. That's just how I do it and how I've developed it through, through the years. Okay, another question is, are there cases that you'll use flat plane or zero, zero degree teeth? And if so, which, what's the situation that you would? Uh, I avoid at all costs. So, so there's my matter what? of fact. So I, 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 I have no use for flat plane teeth, none whatsoever. I will go out of my way not to use them. And I, especially on an upper and lower full denture case, I will always use a mortal and pestle approach, lingualized occlusion, and I will modify things. So sometimes I have to do, depending on the situation, a, a little more grinding than I would typically do to free up the guiding planes. But again, you want that mortal and pestle to crush things. So typically, we, we uh, again, I, 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 I don't use them. I can't remember the last time I've ordered them. All right. So um, more of a technical um, question in a sense. The triangle, or the, you know, the triangle zone uh, is basically the uh, same as the pound zone or the neutral zone, correct? Uh, ish, yes. Ish, yeah. The, 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 I'd have to go back now to the camera. The pound zone is the lingual line on the lower where the where the triangle isn't that sulcus line it's the line from the from the first premolar to the left and right outer limits of that lower retromolar pad so i appreciate our our attendee is is i appreciate where the question's coming from technically the answer is no they are not the same at all but i can see where you can fudge it a little bit um, but typically that pound line is the sulcus line, whereas the inside line on the triangle is that triangular line from the two or the three reference points, the skeletal reference points. So it has nothing to do with the sulcus. All right. Uh, so uh, Mr. Benasha says, thank you. He learned quite a bit. Uh, okay. Same with uh, thank Ahmad. You for so, thank you for learning. Thank you for learning. That was my goal. Get you to think. Thank you very much. Again, I've had I've had 34 years to think, so that's why I'm getting a little tired. But this has been helpful for me clinically, you guys, about reducing the adjustments. You know, sleep, sleep, sleep will help you safe. with that. Yes, it's not about me. It's about the patient. So I see it now is what do I have to do? What do I have to change of myself to make it work for that person? And that's how I, I approach a setup. I don't let it scare me. I just go, okay, well, I got to put things here and put it there. And that's what it has to, that's what I have to do. I just use product that lets me do that. And the product that helps me do that is, is Vita and the lingo form. That's, that's why I, I, I'm here to share my journey with you. And so that you guys and all of everyone can be the superhero that the patient is expecting of us. Because it's all right, well, thank you. Well said. Uh, is there anything else you want to wrap up with, uh, Mark? I think that we can. No, that's it. I'm all right. Thank you. If you need me, get a hold of me privately, and I'll always be here to help and support you because I love my professions. I want to support and grow my professions so that, again, we are superheroes. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for learning right. and challenging yourself. Well, like always, Mark, appreciate our great uh, bank of knowledge you provide. Um, you know, don't overthink it. Get some rest uh, every once in a while. Uh, and, you know, everyone learns every time they watch uh, you during these webinars. It's, it's always great information. Helps us at, in our profession. And we greatly appreciate your time and effort here. Awesome. I'd like to thank everyone that participated in today's uh, webinar. And this will conclude the uh, Mark Wagon Seal um, Vita Learning Webinar for today. Thank you very much Thanks. for joining us.
Thanks, everybody. Woot, woot. We don't slap teeth together. Thanks, well said. You got it. Thanks.